not just organic, but also inorganic as well, uh, as they are the architects of the soil. So kind of uh, my pursuit was interested in environmental remediation, bioremediation, and, you know, I kind of pivoted from a kind of mycocentric to more understanding that there is all these consortiums that work together to understand soil and the microorganisms that are turned dirt into soil, the organic matter, and the biology. So we're kind of in an amazing uh, period here in human history. Uh, we're realizing that we need to act critically to um, repair our soils. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to sequester carbon, to produce food that is nutri uh, that is incredibly nutrient dense, uh, and also um, you know work it towards a greater symbiosis. So hopefully this will kind of start a conversation. People have anecdotes. Um, you know, with growing kind of out there, but also too with people that have more of a conventional science background that are interested in investigating these amazing conditions that maybe haven't been looked at in the you know the most uh, the most quantitative fashion. Yet, although there's good uh, qualitative assessment, so that's a little two bit intro. And uh, Leighton, I'm going to pass it on to you, and we'll kind of get things going. Hello, all. hello, all. Uh, my name is Leighton Morrison. I'm a soil biologist, soil engineer. I've uh, been traveling the country uh, teaching as well as uh, converting dirt back into soil and teaching other people how to do it. Um, so my passion is is both lies in the citizen science world, uh, understanding some of these uh, interesting connections and interrelationships with communities of biology, not specifically one or two types. Um, that was another reason why we brought this room together so that we could also start fighting uh, the more scientific side to connect with the, the with the layman's, the, the people actually out there doing the work at a you know a daily day by day basis, and hopes to get some symbi symbiotic relationships happening. Um, I know that you know science as a whole is very focused uh, in reduction to get answers, and we're hoping that we can get it more in interdisciplinary um, and start having some deeper conversations about how science can work with with the people in the field and the people in the field can help understand or uh, teach more things back to the scientists um, that have, have taken the, the reductionist approach. So that's mine in a nutshell. Uh, happy to be here. How about you, Dan? Uh, well, thanks. thanks for having me here. Um, yeah, I, you know, after having this last few sessions, I was like, uh, I'm trying to synthesize what it is we're talking about. So I realized, I, I guess my lifelong uh,
with the larger environment on either scale. So it's something we hope to kind of move down in the future as well. So yeah, um, so hopefully we'll be joined by uh, by Tom Lai. He's a uh, he's a he's a microbiologist based out of Seattle. He fo he focuses and works on uh, the thanogenic anaerobic microbes, definitely especially in the uh, natural farming community. There are a huge amount of uh, aspects of working with fermentation processes. Um, although there are interesting a lot, there is interesting kind of concepts that the way we can build soils rather than it just being a notion of an aerobic activity in natural kind of biogeochemical cycles and even hydrological cycles, there are periods where um, these environments can go anaerobic for certain air, for low kind of biological activity, but during that fermentation process is essential to kind of perform most, perform most of the heavy lifting and work that can make these aerobic uh, metabolism processes a lot better. So long story short, uh, hopefully we'll, uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully Tom will be joining us a bit later today, but we definitely want to get people on and get some questions. I do see uh, Max Lee is on. We're going to bring them up and we'll see here. So when we bring people up today, we kind of want to keep the number of people on the stage to a relative size. So we'll bring you up. Uh, we definitely want to ask, ask them about whether you got a question or a comment, we can kind of jumpstart the conversation from our experiences. Uh, and we do kind of want to keep the, uh, the stage kind of small. That way people can get up and cycle. We are planning to set up an email address or some kind of way so that if the group does get large, people are able to kind of uh, phone in a question or message in a question so that way we can kind of aggregate them, especially if they have uh, similar comments as well. Max, how's it going? Uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, a little bit about who you are and what you do and maybe a uh, comment or question to kind of kick start the conversation for the evening. Awesome. Hi, Greg. And everyone else, so great to be here, and thanks for inviting me up. I recently, you know, lover of nature, technology, where these things come together. I uh, love what you guys are talking about. I worked for four years in New York City, growing hydroponic herbs for some of my I was designing systems. So systems R&D engineer, and that was a super controlled environment system indoor inside of shipping containers and a lot of interesting interactions in the microbial side um, that I, I went through over there so that's kind of a little bit of of me i'm a mechanical engineer i like electrical i do thing and i like to bring plants in so mechatronic plants and and i think fungi are also the future amazing so my question is i had a question you guys Right when I came in the room, we're talking about some input, um, and you guys use an acronym, and uh, I wasn't exactly sure what you guys were talking about, so I was hoping um, to maybe hear a little bit more about what that was, and uh, you guys said it was an input for farming, and also it could be for human consumption even as well. So I, thought, I just thought that was super interesting, I'd love to learn more about that. Yeah, Leighton, do you want to kind of start things off with... Uh talking about oh and i can kind of fill in if you, if you need me to but i definitely want to pass the mic to get the speaker line moving around yeah sure um it's it's a i think it's about three thousand year old um practice that that happened or started in japan um it was an approach to helping farmers um achieve higher uh yields of crops um with very very simple um, methods that were affordable for the farmer to make on his uh, farm. So there, are, it starts with what's called IMO, which is an indigenous microorganism collection. And in natural farming, you're going to hear everything has an acronym. Um, it does get a little confusing, but there are some great websites out there um, that you can look up these uh, individual acronyms and get a better feel for what they stand for. And as a uh, someone who's a farmer or into plant nutrition, you will quickly quickly realize how powerful um, these these inputs are or solutions. Um, so IMO is is the is the backbone of it, and so that's about collecting uh, these microorganisms and then stabilizing them and then growing them out. And once you grow these out, and it's it's basically the 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 fungi side of things. So you're, you're, you're looking to collect yeasts, algae, fungi, uh, both uh, saprobes as well as micro uh, mycorrhizae, 
uh, spores, and then um, that's the foundation. So now you're starting with a really uh, solid uh, biological life. <clears throat> and then the, the concept behind these nutrient solutions is that by not forcing the plant to do uh, all the heavy lifting, taking the sunlight, converting it into ATP, converting that into exudates, pushing those down into the soil, getting the soil microbials to do their work in mining nutrients out of the sand, silk, clay, and organic matter to bring that back up into the plant to do its function. So by applying these solutions uh, foliarly, you are putting, you're taking a lot of the hard work out of the system for the plant, and it can therefore focus on its secondary metabolites, which is what we're looking for in the end. Um, so specifically, uh, OHN is, I believe it's Oriental, uh, Craig, jump in on that one. Oriental what? Oriental herbal nutrient. Um, yeah. and, and the, the short focus of it is to more so when we're, when we're doing these collections of microbes, cause oftentimes in a lot of systems where we're trying to grow, you know, plants or plants that we desire, um, usually there's been some kind of impact upon human activity. So in nature, we understand that when there's an impact event, and this can happen due to a fire, it can happen to an earthquake, um, it can happen just to human activity, um, the natural ecosystem will go, go back to this process of uh, going through succession. So either going from, let's say in the worst case scenario, like a bare uh, parent material of just like the rock and then you're getting the organisms such as uh, fungi and algae making lichens that are able to, you know, basically biologically weather the material. And then you're getting the kind of uh, beginning of soil crust organisms that will start generating biomass, converting the, the sunlight, basically using the energy from the sunlight, fixing the carbon dioxide um, out of the air, using water to perform a reducing reaction to make, make sugars. And then, you know, at prote uh, proteins and other kind of uh, photosynthates and then gradually the succession will go through the process of where you're getting the notion of weeds, these annual plants that will put a lot of energy into uh, seed production and vegetative growth, not too much into uh, root production. Then gradually you'll get the successional aspect. So kind of imagine on one aspect of session, obviously one end being like a bare kind of rock surface or the beach, and then imagine a rainforest, imagine all the kind of gradual successional successions that are happening there. So the notion is in a lot of human activity, we want to kind of repair the soil and also the types of plants we're growing are going to require some t certain types of consortium microbes. Usually the, the notion that is pretty simple is understanding the ratio of bacteria to fungi. Uh, most, uh, most, most cruciferous vegetables or brassicas, they're usually perform more of a bacterially dominant soil versus if you're trying to grow vegetables or row crops, you're gonna need more fungi. And these are essential to the fact that these organisms have co-evolved with these uh, microbes to help them uh, trade their photosynthates for the micronutrients, macronutrients, and trace elements that are present in the sand, silt, and clay, but also the organic matter. So getting back to OHN, um, the Oriental Herbal Nutrients. So when you do a collection of these microbes, um, which is called IMO, to get it to a state where you can pretty much, after stabilizing it, um, where you can then inoculate it as the beginning of a kind of a compost inoculum, you need to select out the opportunistic organisms, some kind of pathogenic microbes that could potentially uh, can spoil or contaminate. So the notion of OHN is a composition of um, angelica, licorice root, cinnamon bark, uh, garlic, and ginger that is basically fermented in, uh, in certain portions of a, of a, of a low alcoholic uh, fermented uh, beer beverage, and then also to uh, a kind of more of a spear. And the notion is you're basically making a tincture and slow ferment and combining them. The notion is that these are these kind of potent uh, phytochemicals present in the herbs will pretty much select out the opportunistic pathogenic bacteria and fungi that may be present in your collection. So kind of like Leighton said, there's a whole universe of acronyms with natural farming practices. Um, in Max, if you're interested, look them up online. You can kind of search uh, Korean natural farming or KNF. That's kind of what Americans tend to call it, even though it's called natural farming all over the world, mostly because the uh, one of the people that kind of predominantly started reporting it, translating English was uh, was Korean. So hence that aspect, but there's a whole slew of them as well. Definitely, you can check out uh, Chris Trump, uh, no relation. Uh, you can check out, um, uh, he's in the natural farming company, but he's he's uh, he's someone that started in Hawaii, started really kind of taking the knowledge uh, from Korean, turning it into English and making it applicable and reasonable everyday kind of a cultural farming approach. Cool. Uh, Max, did that uh, help to uh, answer the question? In a, in a succinct way. <laughs> yeah, totally. That was amazing. You guys, so knowledgeable.
and uh, just loved that whole thing. I think especially what you said about brassica, bacteria, and row crops, like in fungi, um, and that, that ratio between bacteria and fungi, because it looks to me, you know, and I guess at the high level, just reflecting what you guys said, the OHN is, is one way of, of, you know, coming out of the fermentation process with a better balance of these things, fungi and bacteria that you want in a certain kind of grow. Is that kind of what the application would be? Like you would use the fermentation process to select? Well, so, so, so yes, there, there are other ferments that are used as kind of um, basically processes that have utilized the anaerobic or the kind of more so reduced oxygen facultative anaerobic conditions to break down a lot of the components that can free them up for fungi or other organisms. There's, there's a lot more nuance to it. It's kind of hard to, you know, put into a medium sized nutshell. Uh, but the notion of OHN was used to select out for potential pathogens you may pick up from doing a wild culture. Now, and kind of, uh, I definitely want to touch about some of the background that you come from with controlled environment agriculture. Um, one of the big things that, you know, that I was kind of, I know, I know a number of friends that actually, uh, I've, I've actually, I've actually, I think I've taught at Square Roots as well. Um, so I've, so I've known a number of people that, that have been there, I think back in 2017. Uh, and the notion in general is that with um, what oftentimes a number of hydroponic or controlled environment agricultural systems, you have to be very careful about uh, potential contamination sources. Uh, because if you're running the system without like a pre inoculum of certain algae or bacteria to kind of establish a basis, uh, if you introduce a source point of contamination of a pathogenic bacteria, opportunistic, uh, opportunistic fungi, opportunistic bacteria on your plants, and even, you know, the, even the kind of the basis of nemato nematodes or microarthropods, there's really no microbiome in that system um, that's going to protect the plants. And so the idea is like moving more towards emulation systems such as you know, aquaponics, um, aquaponics more so the longer you work the system, the more you're trying to emulate a natural ecosystem because the idea is these consortiums of microbes are acting as a means to mediate whatever large shifts that can occur to protect the macroorganisms. So I think there are definitely opportunities that as we kind of need to ultimately kind of grow food in less than accessible areas. I think there's great ways to take some of the advantages of vertical farming and controlled environment agriculture along with introducing kind of ecosystem emulation, both indoor, um, both using other organisms to, as nutrient sources, uh, but also as other organisms to help boost plants ability to uh, pull nutrients out of solution, especially some of the natural bio biomineralization processes and potentially even reduce the introduction of uh, these kind of inputs that are that are something that's not really talked about too much, uh, especially the, the phosphorus problem. Uh, if we're gonna have vertical farming, um, we're about to reach peak phosphorus, I believe by 2050. Uh, most of the phosphate ore is located in, uh, I think mostly, I believe Morocco. Uh, so it's it's a natural as if we can source these uh, macronutrients in ways that are biologically sourced or even from the parent material, uh, we can kind of emulate these uh, natural ecosystem processes. You know, I'd love to, oh, go ahead, Lee. Yeah, um, so I mean, first off, I want to echo that thing Craig just said about peak phosphorus. I'm glad to hear it's 2050, because when I was going to school there, it was 2030. Point is, a lot of the fertilizers we use, even if it's trace minerals, they come from rocks and mountains and ashes and things like that. And we got to be aware of how much of them are going to be available long term. But I just, I just wanted to rant a moment about brassicas, because brassicas are one of the, you know, brassicaceae, the plant family, is one of the few plant families that does not form mycorrhizal associations. It's unmycorrhizal, so they don't really grow well with them. The brassicas are also known to be very effective at accumulating heavy metals in their tissues. I actually talked to someone years ago who had basically pinpointed that he had he, st he was a doctor. He started having all these neurological deficiencies and was like, I've been eating kale that was grown near a coal power plant where coal ash is getting deposited on the soil and had high levels of thallium, which is super toxic. So... These, you know, just things to keep aware of with growing brassicas, but even though they don't grow mycorrhizae, they do have profound relationships with a type of fungus called dark septate endophytes, where black septate endophytes, one or the other, because they look up, they show up like inside plant tissue, and they're like this dark mycelium that actually performs a lot of the functions that maybe a mycorrhizae would form or perform 
which is the like, you know, they, it's these endophytic fungus that live inside of them and help with nutrient cycling and things like that. So brassicas are interesting in terms of plants we grow, whether you're using them as a cover crop, growing them for food or whatnot. But it's kind of just to illustrate the point that every plant has a different type of relationship with the fungi in the community. And there's a lot of different types of fungi. So these are things we should be aware of when we're trying to like dial in the biological growing strategy for each given plant. So now I'm going to hop in on phosphate cellulizing bacteria. Um, one of the reasons why um, I spent my or my world is all about aquaponics is because uh, we have a number of uh, organisms that in the water column that are critical for um, mining these materials out of the soil. And one of them is phosphate solubilizing bacteria. And um, so in the water column, <clears throat> you will get, you're going to get nitrifying bacteria, phosphate solubilizing bacteria, uh, potassium solubilizing bacteria, and a host of other communities. Um, in my work is a lot of the times is taking dirt and turning it back into soil. So reeling this conversation all the way back up to the opening discussion about using anaerobes as a way to push soil succession um, has been one of the key focuses of my work. And so I will be called in on say a 10 acre um, cornfield that is now trying to be converted into a hay. Uh, the first thing I will do is apply an anoxic. So that's not anaerobic, but it's not aerobic. It's in between one part per million and about six parts per million oxygen. Uh, but these organisms do really great work at starting to stabilize the soil. So there's a lot of algae, there's a lot of yeasts involved in it, um, but they help to jumpstart the system so that when I come back and apply six months later an aerobic uh, extract, I will get an incredible result because the foundation is actually there. So again, you know, there's, I, I like to think or I like to talk about how before the great human expansion, <clears throat> um, we had mass migrations, which we no longer have. So whether it was ducks, uh, you know, songbirds or geese, darkening the sky, landing in water, getting covered with these microorganisms, flying miles, shedding them off as they flew, uh, eat, you know, pooping them, urinating them. Um, same with the four legged crashing through rivers, lakes and streams, dragging this stuff up onto the land. Uh, both in their clumps of hair that are caked with biofilm uh, that slowly fall off. Um, so the system, the earth was constantly being inoculated by aquatic uh, organisms, as well as the aquatic ecosystem was constantly being inoculated with terrestrial organisms called erosion, washdown, rain events. So there is, there's very little difference between aquatic and terrestrial environments. They are constantly interacting. Um, although there are specific organisms that live specifically in either or place, uh, but there's a lot of crossovers and we will definitely get into that some more tonight. So uh, next question. Yeah, Max, definitely glad to have you up. Um, I'm going to, was there any last quick little comments? I'm going to add you back to the audience, but I want to keep the cycling going. That's, that's really it. Thank you guys so much. Your knowledge is amazing. I've never heard of dark mycelium before and the solubilization uh, thing that you were talking about, Leighton, was blowing my mind. You guys are great, happy to be here. Hope to talk more about some of these, you know, smaller systems that are specific to certain plants and maybe are separate from the normal environment or the larger earth environment, but somehow controlled, minimized, specialized systems that we can build to let, let's say grow brassicas really well. And what would we introduce into that kind of a system to just really grow brassicas and blow that out of the water and keep the, the inputs to that, um, you know, somehow working in that sustainable direction, avoiding something like a peak phosphate situation where we can't get those inputs or something. So love, love what you guys are doing here. Thank you so much for having yeah, me. Yeah, keep, keep up with us, Max. You know, we will be, going down those individual rabbit holes, but there is plenty of information out there that if properly assembled, you can tailor biology specific to plants uh, based on the understanding that we have in this day and age. So, you know, in this regard, it's a great time to be alive. Awesome. Thank you, Max, so much. 
Uh, Sean, I'm going to ask you to come up next. Max, I'm going to put you back back down the audience. Sean, I'm just going to reset the room before uh, I invite you to speak. Uh, so everyone kind of is just joining. This is uh, kind of Microbial Ecology Club, this inaugural talk, Microbial Ecology of Living Soil. We hope to kind of facilitate conversations between people that are growers of any kind, any kind of plant, any kind of organism, um, and any kind of system, whether it's conventional, uh, organic, regenerative, biodynamic, uh, aquaponic, hydroponic, and kind of bring these anecdotes together, which are these amazing observations and interactions with the natural world that we're having, uh, especially as human beings interacting with biology to make it produce it some of the time. That's the notion of this interaction. But the idea is to potentially bring these conversations with people that have more of a formal academic background that are investigating or looking for new interesting things to study and focus on as we're kind of this very fascinating point where really the biology as a science is coming to age and through a number of uh, processes of, of DNA sequencing and molecular genetics, we can articulate where, what roles these consortiums are doing both individually but as a community and then also with their symbionts and host organisms. So reset the room. So definitely follow Microbial Ecology. Uh, definitely follow us. We'd love to keep up with y'all and do things that provide perspectives, people that are both kind of anywhere, no matter where you are in your journey of learning about how to interact, observe, and and apply um, organisms on a macroscopic to microscopic scale. All right, Sean, go ahead, introduce yourself a little bit and uh, feel free to add a question or comment. So I'm pretty much a new guy to living soil as throw it under that banner. I'm kind of curious as, as a new practitioner, I've really moved you know, the entry stages into KNF. While in KNF, I've started reading a little bit about JADAM. And what I've noticed is there are certain things, say like FAA for those fish amino acids, that's a process that is best utilized after a year. So however, the my, where I am in the US, we're approaching springtime. So I have a need for nitrogen. How can I borrow from another system? I mean, be it KNF, JADAM, you know, living soil, permaculture, there's all these different things that really still fall under living soil. How can I plug in to find a resource that I'm missing that I can generate relatively faster? You know, is there a database out there or something that I can just plug in a macro or micronutrient and then boom, it'll give me something, hopefully something local. You know, I, I know I could always, you know, jump into like fish meal, kelp meal or anything else like that but I would also like to remain as local as possible. Um, yeah, there's actually quite a bit of information right now about the fact that there is a tremendous amount of nitrogen already existing in the soil. So I always say the first thing first is test the soil. You may not need to add nitrogen. You may, not, you may actually have to add potassium or calcium um, to get your, your system into balance. So always start with a soil test first um, as far as a really good solid fish hydrolysate, which will provide you um, some of that nitrogen that you're looking for, there's a company called Fish Brew um, out of Cape Cod. They're making a 100% cold brewed uh, fish hydrolysate. You're not getting the, 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 all the uh, essential oils, uh, aminos, everything is intact. And they've, they've been really religious about providing the best product on the market. A lot of other guys will cook it, uh, so they'll heat it up and you're gonna lose a lot of the uh, really good volatile organic compounds in the heating process, um, as well as they strip the fish oil. And that fish oil is a critical uh, component to getting that biological activity up to snuff um, and then actually start mining those, you know, that, those uh, main macronutrients out of your existing soil profile. Uh, there's some really interesting studies uh, showing for fact that there is, is huge nitrogen pools in our soil, um, but they're just not being actively mined because you don't have the right bacteria to do so. And if I could, a, one, a second question, and hopefully this doesn't make it too political. So where I am now, um, I have three, three warm bins getting ready to start a fourth with African night crawlers, European night crawlers, red wigglers, and I'm waiting for my Alabama jumpers. I've got a pretty large uh, leaf collection that's going, but again, that's gonna probably take another year plus. Uh, I've a standard compost, I'm doing some bokashi, and I'm also setting up a, a small koi aquarium. So given, 
you know, say in a year to two years where I'm fully up and running, I've got all my natural inputs going. Is there any reason that I could not compete both in quality and quantity with someone that's going out there that's spending money, you know, every week throwing down recharge or mycos or some other uh, microbial product? If I'm just using natural inputs, do you feel you, you would be able to compete with someone that's using commercial products heavily? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you just, you just listed off, I don't know how many different nitrogen products um, that you're already making in your inputs. So, so leaf mold is a carbon source. Um, the worm, your worm compost, that's a great nitrogen source along with a tremendous amount of other um, incredible, valuable uh, micronutrients. Um, and as far as the koi pond is concerned, there's your nitrifying bacteria. So they'll begin to mine uh, the stuff out of the soil that is present or bound up in a form that the plant can't actually start to use. So those combinations, you're going to knock it out of the park and you're not going to be paying for all those inputs. I know guys that do cannabis, which is a heavy feeder. So like a tomato plant, um, and they do not use any sources of nitrogen or phosphorus. They just use compost that they make themselves. They use vermicompost that they make themselves and they top dress uh, just before flower and just after each run, and they're not using any inputs. So you will absolutely knock it out of the park and you will have a higher level of all of those um, secondary metabolites that you're looking for. And as well as, you know, you get back into, if you're growing food, you're gonna have more nutrient dense food. Um, if this is cannabis related, you're gonna have uh, minor cannabinoids or cannabinols or terpenes that are not normally expressed in a situation where you're using synthetics or a combination of synthetics and natural sources. So no, trust, trust the, trust the process, um, do your homework, but you're right out of the gate. You're already doing everything you need to do, uh, to, to push on through this. I hope that helped. That does. I don't have any other questions. That's it. Thank you all for you know, putting this together. Awesome. Thank you, Sean. I'm going to move back to the audience. And just to kind of uh, reset the room for everyone who's just joining, um, so this is uh, Microbial Ecology Club's inaugural uh, session. So we definitely want to start understanding that the world we live in is a one that is facilitated and maintained by consortiums of microbes. So we're hoping to bring people that have lots of incredible anecdote and growing in any system and application. And also, well, kind of uh, bring those perspectives in when people have more, more formal background as well. So definitely, um, I'd love to feel pe people feel free to raise your hands, come on up. Uh, but Leighton, I want to kind of um, kind of po pose a cash question to you and kind of thinking about, we talked about how both microbes that live both in the uh, aquatic systems and both terrestrial systems, about how they, they're kind of concurrent in both environments at different times. So kind of the, uh, the thought experiment I tried to pose is imagining a kind of riparian system or a river estuary system where there is a snowpack in the winter time and low flow of a river and you have the sediment which is kind of settling out and not really being disturbed and you're getting this layers of microorganisms kind of going going on these fermentation processes now late when that snowpack melts what do you think is going to be happening to that those kind of those fermentation products in the sediment uh and those kind of interactions between microbes that are kind of just sitting in the uh the low flow river as it kind of picks up and flow due to all the snowpack melt and then maybe getting up into the river banks as well kind of pose that notion how we can maybe give some intuition wins about how people are working to uh, brew teas and integrate aquatic organisms with terrestrial organisms oh man this is one of my favorite rabbit holes uh, i love talking about water and the power of it um, so let's just take a little journey here uh, to a mountain range and we have some rain events we have some snow events and then we have the flush coming in spring so all of a sudden all this water starts to move very rapidly down these steep embankments um, tossing rocks and pebbles and sand and crashing them into each other and creating this incredibly minerally rich uh, aquatic or, or water system, water source, for lack of better words. Now that water source comes crashing down the mountain and it hits into a uh, floodplain where the water slows down, the river becomes uh, more meandering, um, and, and here it starts to pick up that silt that has been sitting there uh, all winter, just slowly congealing and, and being mined by these uh, microbes. Um, and again, what the microbes are doing is they're consuming that, that silt, which is essentially a very fine broken down organic matter. So it's loaded with nutrients 
and they're storing it in their bodies. And now they're getting stirred up because of all of this excess water coming down and they're basically building a nutrient bomb, both biologically as well as the nutrients in the water itself. The ideal system for, for producing plant growth. Um, then that meanders along down the river, gets stronger and stronger. The tannins, the, the, the turbidity of the water becomes to the point where you can stick your hand in there and you can't even see your fingertips. Now that is, again, an incredibly powerful uh, compost extract, for lack of better words. Um, so the ideal thing for, for plant growth. So, you know, I did some work with Hydro Cedar back a number of years ago who wanted to go uh, completely organic. And the problem was that he had, you know, the, the base product for um, the hydro seeding is a synthetic product that does have NPK in it. And so we, we were able to find a paper pulp product, find the right grass seed. And I encouraged him to, instead of pumping the town water out of the, out of the fire hydrant, to actually pump it out of the river uh, that was right next to the property. Um, and it was, it was springtime and that water was chocolate. And he, he applied it. Um, it went it went fantastic. The grass exploded. Um, and then he came back uh, and did another section or excuse me, he didn't do it. Uh, one of his other employees came back and did another section and did not follow that protocol. And it was very evident uh, within two weeks um, of, of this initial grout, uh, grout, uh, seed crack that these were completely different systems. And the client was flabbergasted. Uh, they called the, the owner back and he was like, well, I know we pumped the river for this one. And what did you do for this one? And it turns out, no, he used the hydrant, which has, you know, essentially chlorine, chloramine, fluoride, which are biocides. So the difference was, was night and day. So there's a kind of anecdotal approach to understanding how valuable that type of water system is. Um, and again, remember that, that that silt during the course of its slow period or, or settle down or breakdown was completely anaerobic. I mean, we've all been in a situation where we're walking along a riverbank, our foot sinks into the mud, we pull it back up and it smells horrible. That's an anaerobic digestion. So, but once you get those anaerobes stabilized or what I like to call aerobically stabilized, now you're pushing into a whole nother level where those anaerobes become food for the aerobes and it just boost the whole system. Think prey predator. The more deer you have, the more coyotes, the more bears, the more mountain lions will come until, they're, until the prey are all gone and then the predators move on. So I hope that was a, a good way to jumpstart the next conversation. Definitely love it. And definitely those interactions between organisms on the whole scale of aerobic to facultatively and uh, anaerobic to even the anoxic and they played different roles. And Definitely um, something that's really interesting when you think about how a lot of our relationships with microbes have been based upon the precedents by which we first start to understood them. I think we can kind of trace back the understanding of observing microorganisms can kind of go back to uh, Anthony von Leeuwenhoven with his kind of creations of the, uh, the first improved microscopes, kind of going back to the naming of uh, these organisms he was able to observe, the micros first micro microscopic organisms that kind of uh, even named them an animalcules. So then even we move forward to the understanding of the microbial theory to uh, potentially disease with coke uh, and kind of making these uh, making these connotations and understandings of how to culture them as a means of understanding uh, pathogens and even too with preserving milk well preserving certain foods and protect them from certain from opportunistic pathogens that may be uh, potential uh, that may be potential source points for disease uh, food related disease through uh, through pastor and tindal um, however, one interesting scientist that definitely we should focus on is uh, Sergei Winogradsky. So, what Sergei Winogradsky was a was a um, was a contemporary of the age, but rather than trying to isolate organisms on a defined set medium, um, he looked into understanding culturing the whole ecosystem in itself. So, one of me, one interesting that really you can dive down into is the Winogradsky column, the notion of going to a salt marsh and collecting the salt marsh mud and putting it into a a cylinder in this column. You could get a representation of all the different microbial communities, whether the aerobic onto the top or the phototrophic where you're getting algae on the top in general, you're getting um, lower, you're moving down to the sediment and silt, you're getting lower oxygen concentration. So slightly uh, some more aerobic, maybe not phototrophic, but still, uh, but still uh, obtaining their energy sources from organic material. 
further down to the facultative anaerobes, further down the column, and all the way down to the anoxic, where you're getting a number of these organisms that are having metabolisms where they're uh, performing redox reactions on a number of elements in the sediment. So it's amazing because one of the biggest kind of conundrums with as we're entering the microbial age is the fact that uh, we can only culture roughly less than 2% of the microbes on a defined medium. And this is the fact that the conditions that these organisms survive in, you know, just they're not, they're, they're kind of hard to tease out. However, so it's interesting that the, for the first point, as we can culture these and the cost of sequencing these organisms DNA and even more impressive, the, the tools to assemble their genomes and to, to uh, analyze their, their functions of genes and not only individually, but also with consortiums working together in these kind of uh, these macroscopic multi multicellular kind of pathways that have these larger macro metabolism. Um, one of the interesting is how can we start thinking about kind of co-culturing organisms all together in unison because the uh, related is that we kind of have focused on this reduced system, which is important to kind of study and document. But we're, once we start looking at how these consortiums of organisms work together, and interact and also kind of these emergent properties that happen when they're there we might understand kind of some of the problems we've been having by reducing biodiversity kind of uh, kind of uh, putting in a monoculture this so notion of dysbiosis and how we can solve a lot of the potential problems in our ecology and environment which may even be models for how we can approach uh, our own individual animal and human health as well so kind of never point kicking off uh, kicking that off I'm going to pass it over to Lee for maybe a little comment on that, but I definitely want to encourage the room, anyone to come on up, uh, feel free to ask questions or comments. We want to make this in a conversation open to all, no matter where you are in your journey and understanding the natural world, whether it's from just growing, whether it's from being a student, whether it's a combination of both, but we want to definitely help facilitate this conversation. So don't be shy, hop on up. Yeah, you know, the previous uh, conversation, <laughs> you had uh, proposed the question about snow and snow melt and you know the microbial influences of that which Leighton did a great job of peering into that topic it's very complex and I feel like still very unknown but I mean when we think about big scale ecological perspectives that's uh, that, that's a very important thing to keep in mind depending on where you live but you know like out say you're on the west coast and you say you live in California or somewhere like a majority of the water that feeds your ecosystem is from snow melt and like the Sierra Nevadas and other of those northern those mountain ranges in northern California. So like when we were thinking about the big picture ecological scale, like what you know, like where I live in North Carolina, there's snow on the mountains, but there's not a lot and it rains a bunch here. It's basically a rainforest. But if you're over, you know, in the western mountains and like that snowpack melting in the spring, that like that's the slow release of water coming into the ecosystem every spring, every summer. And so when we're, you know, this is maybe getting a little too big picture, but when we're thinking about like living soils, like where do your resources come from? And that's what it's ultimately about, right? Is that it's like, you could import all the materials you need to grow stuff from somewhere else, but that all costs money. It uses fossil fuels. It's, you know, ultimately, could be creating ecological imbalance so like getting that like place dependent context of like where do you live where does the water come from where you live where do the nutrients come from where do the organisms come from hopefully they're already there and you can source them but um also getting into like what craig you were saying about the, the winograski columns and the idea of, like trying to study nature not just like here's an organism here's what it does but when we take a chunk of soil from this ecosystem and then stick it into a contained environment, what does it do? When we're taking that chunk of soil, we don't know what's in it. It's not going to be one organism. It's going to be many organisms in it. And we don't necessarily know what they do, but like there is work that indicates that this method can have great potential. Like I'm thinking of the work of someone like, like John Todd, if, if you all are familiar with him, he was an old, I, I might even say legendary applied ecologist because he was someone who was more of an ecologist, just ecosystems and how they function, but eventually started setting up these systems where you would, you know, get a grant from some town in New England to treat landfill leachate water, mine waste water. And instead of, you know, kind of doing a more engineered system, what he'd do is set up a series of tanks, fill them with water, and then 
this tank gets a handful of swamp water. This tank gets a handful of river water. This tank gets a handful of stream water. This tank gets a handful of lake water. And when you drop that water in these tanks, stuff grows out in them. And then after a few weeks, it actually turns into an ecosystem because of all the spores, all the, the seeds, all the algal you know, pieces of material. And then you can actually pump like dirty landfill leachate water through a series of these tanks and basically eliminate everything in them because it's leveraging like this super diverse ecology. And a lot of like the bioremediation work has always been focused on like, what is the singular organism that can break down this contaminant? But then if it's this more like ecological context of like, we don't even know what, what the organisms in the system are, but when we line up a series of like thousands or more organisms, they break it all down. And this is, it's almost, it's, you know, it's like physical ground truthing of like what's going on in nature. We can talk about this nutrient, this organism, and it might work in this setting, but then it's like, you know, kind of how do we think about incorporating, you know, all the components to achieve much more challenging tasks. And that's a little bit of a tangent, but that kind of thinking can really be beneficial in agriculture as well, because when we get into the soil food webs and, you know, these things get the nutrients, these things eat, thing, eat them, these things poop them out, the plants eat them, and it's just this feedback cycle. It's the kind of level of thinking that's very, I feel like, beneficial to take on to turn cultivation and land management from not being this like mysterious, uh, I put this in, I hope it works thing to more of a like, you know, you do something and you can kind of troubleshoot what happened and why it may or may not have worked. Leaf, I believe that gentleman used a lot of plants as well, didn't he? Oh yeah, no plants. But so, so the thing is, yeah, he was adding plants, but it was literally like taking a cup of water out of a swamp or a lake and dumping that into another thing of water. You wait a few weeks and all of a sudden, like, boom, here's a bunch of types of algae. Here's some floating aquatic plants. I mean, just by taking a cup of water, you're seeding it with this stuff. That, that, like, that, was, that was what was so fascinating about it. It wasn't like, it was like, all right, I'm going to add a bunch of, you know, like lily pads and rushes and stuff to this tank. It was like, I'm going to take water out of, a, out of a stream and drop it in here. And, oh, that water happens to have a bunch of spores and seeds and stuff. And then they establish already. And then it creates a diverse ecology because if you take a scoop of water out of a healthy ecosystem i mean it's got all the kingdoms of life in it already yeah i think that's that, called an amo aquatic microorganisms just like definitely, natural farming definitely and i think one of the biggest purposes that we see in a, a number of these systems whether it's organic whether it's regenerative whether it's biodynamic I, the bigger focus that a lot of the common thread is to try to emulate ecosystems it's understanding that the relationships that have developed over several hundreds of millions of years as organisms have co-evolved to you know survive in the transition of a more so sterile environment to you know to work together through basically harvesting the energy from the sun basically the first photosynthesizing organisms to allow these exudates these photosynthates to be kind of the the reducing agents that are basically driving this whole system um it's kind of this understanding that we the more we try to emulate these ecosystems and these natural uh biotic and biotic responses to the abiotic conditions and settings the better results we do get so i think that is one of the largest aspects Leighton, so maybe maybe tell the room a little bit about your background of how a lot of your experience in working with aquatic ecosystems and trying to emulate them um, and some of the interesting interactions with, with fermentation as well. I think you mentioned that, you know, with aquaponics, one of the aspects of that often is a problem, but also a great resource is kind of dealing with fish solids. A number of people have filters, but this is something that could be an incredibly powerful source of nutrients for your plants and understanding where we could see this parallel naturally happening in the ecosystem that these organisms living in in uh, estuaries, bodies of water, lakes, or ponds. Thanks, Craig. Um, yeah, so backing it up, when I was a kid, I, uh, I raised fish. Um, and so I would have a breeding tanks set up and I would always plant them um, with the concept or idea of that, you know, making this a really beautiful, happy environment for the fish, they would, they would breed better, uh, stronger uh, offspring. 
Um, and for the most part, it was true. Uh, the fish that I got, I would get top dollar from the pet store and they would always be sold out by the time I got back with more. So uh, one of the lessons I learned early on um, was that I had a male that was an incredible breeder. Um, he did great work, but he was pretty aggressive and he started beating up the female fish at certain points. And so I had to remove him. And I was really upset with him because uh, he actually killed one of my females and I threw him in an isolation tank where I would nurse the, the plants back to health. It's called a hospital tank. Um, <clears throat> and so I decided I'm not going to feed him, not going to do anything. And the algae grew over the tank. Uh, all of a sudden, I noticed this interaction between uh, the plant, the gravel and the fish. The fish's fins just grew incredibly long. The color of the fish was amazing. The water quality changed to this light amber color and he was so active. I mean, he was tearing around. So I quickly began to realize that there was this incredible interaction that I knew nothing about. Um, years go on, I get married. Uh, the, the now ex does not like fish tanks. Uh, so I got rid of them all, um, had children, moved on, went through a horrible divorce uh, and decided I wanted to go back to something other than just making money, something that made my soul feel good. And I started going back to my work with fish and plants and discovered a, a word called aquaponics, which I'd never heard before. Well, aquaponics is the use of fish to grow plants. Um, so I immediately uh, jumped on a plane, flew down to uh, Cancun and went to the second annual aquaponic aquaculture world conference. And I met um, some of my dearest friends uh, to this point in life. Um, who are all, you know, the patriarchs of, of bringing aquaponics to the masses. And soon after that, I went back, I started chasing around different aquaculture companies, being as a source of uh, getting the solids that is, is very problematic in, in aquaponics. Aquaponics never took filtration to the next level uh, that aquaculture did. Aquaculture is intensive fish growing, so it's all about uh, biomass of the fish, to the water to the feed conversion ratio um, so it's very intensive there's a lot of manure made so they strip a lot of that manure out and they just flush it down uh, into the sewer systems and i was horrified to find this out and so i started uh, collecting it and playing with it uh, i had a gentleman who uh, his name was jeff frank he was on long island teaching uh, under the name of green gorillas he was teaching organic land care um, years and years ago and he kept telling me that, Leighton, you've got to bring this stuff to a lane. You've got to bring this to a lane. So finally, one day I went down to Rodale Institute, which I didn't know anything about. Uh, I had a meeting with this woman named Elaine. I, I brought in a vial of my aerobically stabilized fish manure. Um, she put it under a microscope, uh, tilted her head back and was like, oh, my God, where did you get this? And I'm like, well, all I know, Elaine, is when I pour it on plants, I see plant reaction within, you know, literally hours, if not within guaranteed within 24 hours, of course, shrubs and trees, not so they take quite a bit longer. Um, anyway, she was absolutely flabbergasted. I said, well, listen, you know, I'm here. Jeff sent me here. I want to, I want to understand what's going on. Why does this work so well? And she goes, do you have some more time? And I said, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll stay overnight and we can chop it up tomorrow. And she laughed hysterically at me. Well, after 18 months, three to four days a week down at Rodale under her I realized how in-depth this conversation actually was. Um, I learned all about composting, vermicomposting, thermal composting, static pot composting, um, and introduced all of those components into my fish waste to create um, the products that I now um, sell. And by doing that, I realized just how powerful uh, of an of a, of a ingredient that I had stumbled upon or, or I had gotten behind. I started working with different aquaculture companies up and down the East Coast to get more and more resources for uh, my ingredient that I needed. And what I noticed, there was one particular gentleman that I met up with um, in Pennsylvania when he heard I was working at Rodale. Uh, he was like, you're on to something. And I'm like, yeah. And he, he knew he was a really smart guy. Now, he sold fish in the live fish market. So you'd walk into a grocery store or restaurant. You'd look at the fish tank behind the wall. You'd pick a fish. They'd catch it fillet it and send you off or cook it for you. So it was really important, um, the presentation of the fish. So I began working with him on tweaking some of the filtration systems he had, um, changing some stuff up, getting rid of some pipes, adding some aeration. 
Uh, and within a couple of weeks, three weeks, uh, the fish were coming out so much healthier. He had less die off. Um, and I was getting an incredible uh, inoculant that I did not have to spend a tremendous amount of time to aerobically stabilize. Um, the nastier this stuff is, the harder it is to get it to flip to uh, anoxic or anaerobic. Or aerobic. Um, and so there was this, you know, total aha moment where I'm like, oh my God, this, this makes my job easier. This, this is so much better than, than the stuff that is just rancid when I get it. Um, and so lo and behold, you know, I truly believe that, like I said, we've lost the mass migrations. So we've lost that re-inoculation that, that would have occurred on a regular basis, uh, season to season. So that's kind of the background of where I came from. And, you know, anecdotally, um, I will take this product. If I spray it on brand new, just sprouted cover crops or grasses, they will turn neon green. Um, if I spray them on, you know, later successionary plants, I will more often see the colors, uh, reds and purples and, and deep dark maroons come out of the plant within 24 hours. So basically what it's telling me is the plant now has extra energy to, to push or pull more light waves in uh, and produce more currency, to produce more exudates, to grow more. So it really is a, a, an amazing thing. Now, can you get it? Yeah, you can set up a little you know, a, a horse trough in your garage, fill it with koi. I love koi because they have a great feed to conversion ratio, feed conversion ratio. Um, they're easy to, to take care of. You, if they jump out of the tank, you just throw them back in, they'll be fine, um, like tilapia. And they produce a ton of manure. And now the only way, the only thing you have to worry about is how to catch that manure. Well, there's this an amazing little filter that I found that's basically run on air. So you take this little like R2D2 looking thing, you throw them in, the in your tank, um, the air goes into the filter, pulls the water in through the bottom, the air blows out the top and it collects all the solids. So you just throw this thing in there and you pull it out once a week, you dump that in a five gallon compound bucket of water, stir it up, add some compost and you have an amazing uh, full spectrum uh, inoculant for any of your plants. And the other resources are, yeah, you can go to um, estuaries, uh, better to stay away from brackish water and better definitely you need to know your source of, of the river, where it's coming from. You do not wanna be collecting these things in, in industrial zones or in inner cities. Uh, it's just way too polluted. So you have to be you know, thorough about where you're collecting this stuff, but you know, ponds out in the country are a great resource. You know, old um, ir, um, agricultural watering ponds are, are just an amazing source of aquatic microorganisms. Um, but everybody should know about them and, and everybody should be using them. Um, and again, it just takes a little common sense to, to make sure you know the source of what, where it's coming from, um, or you could you know, get yourself in trouble uh, nowadays due to uh, the incredible level of, of you know, toxic things that have built up in our soils. Definitely. Awesome. Thank you, Layden. All right. We have someone coming up interested and definitely want to encourage people to uh, coming up. If you have any questions or comments, uh, Nuan, uh, feel free to introduce yourself, uh, who you are, your background, and let us know your question or comment to kind of keep the conversation into a fascinating direction. Uh, thank you, Craig. My name is Nuan. I'm a home gardener uh, with an interest in microbiology and kind of various biomes. I had a question about the harvesting of uh, like the aquatic uh, bacteria and, and that kind of thing. Uh, pollution aside, is it possible to introduce um, bacteria that could kind of destabilize the biome of my home garden if I use this, this idea? Uh, I have yet to find anything that would destabilize. Um, the, the rule of thumb is that if, if this organism is not suitable for that environment, it will become what's called a biostimulant, therefore a food source. Um, and, and what we now know about a lot of these organisms, um, testate amoeba, you will find them in the water column, you'll find them in the mud, you'll find them in anoxic zones, you'll find them in incredibly aerobic zones, you'll find them on soil, you find them everywhere. So they are, they are a switcher. Um, there's a lot of these bacteria that are, are the same. Um, you know, the nitrifying bacteria, the so phosphate solubilizing bacteria, 
uh, just to name a couple. Uh, the, there's an incredible influence of what I want to call aquatic yeasts that transfer into soil um, and stabilize and inoculate. Um, and then they make the, lay the groundwork for the successionary next step, which is the saprophytic fungi. Um, we can talk a little bit about endophytic fungi. Um, had a great chop up session with Dr. James White. If any of you uh, uh, can look him up, uh, research his work is insane. Uh, he's been doing it for a long time. And uh, he and I and Craig and Leaf had a nice conversation a couple of weeks back about uh, a theory I had about whether um, these endophytics were a successionary stage of, of fungi. And he, he, he confirmed that yes, uh, an endophytic back, uh, fungi living in a leaf, that leaf falls in the fall um, and that endophyte will come out as a saprophyte and start to break down that organic matter. Um, if that leaf falls in a stream or a river, um, it will then emerge as a uh, aquatic fungi and continue on through the cycle and eventually go back to an endophytic. So there's a lot of um, new information coming out nowadays about how um, a lot of these organisms can survive in both aquatic and terrestrial environments. And I want you to think about this, a real healthy soil system, only 50% of it is physical. That's the sand silt, uh, sand, silt, clay, and organic matter. The other 50% is either water or oxygen. So if it's all water, then it would be anaerobic. If it's all air, it would be oxid, oxidative. So like the extreme. Um, so with that understanding, in a healthy soil system that is well aggregated, you're going to have pockets of water that are there. You're going to have rain. You're going to have condensation. You're going to have trickles, streams, rivers, all these things on a microscopic scale. So to ever sit there and say that, oh, well, aquatic, aquatic uh, organisms can't live in terrestrial systems, uh, common sense would, would, would say the opposite. So as far as, as far as worrying about you know, introducing something that could take over your soil system, I would not be worried about that in a healthy soil environment. If you have a sterile soil environment, and you introduce something, well, that's going to inoculate. It's going to take over because there's no competition. Now, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing is, is, is a whole nother question. Because like I said earlier, a lot of times when I'm dealing with dirt or dead soil, I have to step back and transition that. I can't just go out there and apply an aerobic uh, an extract because it's not going to take hold. Um, so I hope that answered your question. That's very interesting. Yes, I think it does. Speaking of the uh, survivability of these organisms, where I live, it's very popular to use um, seaweed extracts and like sea mineral extracts. Um, they have a kind of funk to them. They're green liquids, green brown liquids. I wonder how much of the uh, marine organisms, microorganisms, can survive and inoculate through that uh, method of just like spraying these seaweed extracts. What do you think? I think you know, with, go ahead. Oh, I was say with like some like a sea mineral amendment or a, like a kelp or a seaweed extract, that's generally not so much a biological inoculum. It's more of a, a nutrient supplement, more of a fertilizer because in the ocean, like ocean water tends to have a very good balance of like, you know, 90 to 120 different elements in it, because that's kind of how the ocean is balanced. It's how it was developed and life first evolved in the ocean. So most life that lives in the ocean is tends to be relatively balanced in terms of a trace mineral nutrient uh, perspective, whereas terrestrial life, they have to get the minerals out of the soil. So if the minerals aren't in the soil, then they aren't balanced. Whereas things growing in the ocean, like there's a bunch of nutrients in there. So they tend to be more balanced, which is part of like the the importance of those types of amendments so it's like for things that are you know if it's something come out of the ocean that you're applying a lot of times it is more of a nutrient-based thing but i did want to touch on what your your first question about like these you know potentially uh you know pathogenic or non-ideal microbes taking over when we do think about soil in a soil system like the plants are ultimately the engineers and the architects of the soil and the soil ecosystem so like Leighton was saying, if you have a, a good diversity of microbes and you add too much of some sort of like anaerobic pathogenic thing, the plants through the process of 
photosynthesizing, taking sunlight and carbon dioxide from the air, turning it into sugars. It releases those sugars to feed specific microbes that it wants to grow. So if you have beneficial microbes, the plants are going to feed those things. And the, you know, the pathogenic ones probably aren't going to take over. If it's a blank slate, if it's everything's dead, like was mentioned before, then maybe the pathogens will take over. But is that's the kind of like what, what brings on the point of diversity in a soil microbiome is that the plants are ultimately they like they hold the keys, they hold the cards in their hand. They're the ones that are like, we're gonna dump these types of sugars or these types of carbohydrates to feed these things. So as long as what the plants want is there, they're probably what's gonna dominate. So if like if you have the beneficial stuff, the plants are dumping that. But if there's some bad actors, but then the plants can feed the beneficial ones, the bad actors aren't even really going to grow so much. So, I mean, then these are two of the different layers. Like we have to think about in soil, the, you know, the biological, like what, what I was just talking about there, like the good microbes, the bad microbes, the chemical, which is more of the nutrients, what's available. And that's why people will be adding things from the ocean, these mineral supplements. It's really to get the nutrients and the physical, which Leighton had mentioned before, like healthy soil physically is 50% solid, 50% porous space that water or air could travel through. And so like kind of being aware of those components and their interaction is pretty key. So I'd love to hop in on that too. Um, what I was gonna say is that I'm a big fan of harvesting fresh seaweed, fresh algae, uh, fresh kelp, um, that's washed up on the shore or is you know hanging out at the edge of your creek or your river your lake um, and then fermenting that stuff so taking it putting in a bucket of fresh water um, letting it sit for four or five days till it gets a funk to it um, i noticed that it usually will get some kind of foam um, but it will definitely have this this it won't be a horrible odor it won't it won't smell like you know really nasty but it definitely has a funk to it um, is an amazing inoculant uh, I used that uh, out here in Oxnard uh, this spring when I crash landed here uh, at the beginning of the COVID. And because I needed to make some compost, um, I collected kelp and I, I went through this process and I was amazed at the level of organisms I was able to achieve in a very short period of time. I mean, four weeks, I had uh, some of the best biological inoculant I've ever had. And I, you know, I, I granted, I give that credit to the greens and browns that I collected locally off the property and, and nearby, as well as that biological inoculant. Because again, with inoculant, you're by bringing in all that prey, you're, you're encouraging the predators that are present in a cyst form. Now for you of those out there in the audience that don't know what a cyst is, essentially any of these microorganisms, um, fungi spore, all right? But bacteria, nematodes, protozoa, um, go into what's called a cyst form. And that is basically they coat their, themselves with wax on the outside um, to prevent them from, from drying out or, or, or losing their life. And they can stay in that cyst form for hundreds of thousands of years, perhaps millions. We don't know. Um, but we have found ice cores that are several hundred thousand years old that when you melt the ice, these organisms come right back to life. So um, it's, it's, it's an, a wonderful, amazing inoculant. Now, if you're, it's being processed, in other words, ground up, um, heated up, liquefied, um, I'm not sure what's gonna end up coming through there. Um, I've done a lot of work on pumps um, and, and finding different ways of applying um, as much of the biology as I can without losing it. And anything with a, um, anything that creates cavitation, which is a blender would do, um, you're going to destroy the vast majority of it. Anything that's going through high pressure or high heat, you're going to destroy a lot of them. If it's cold pressed, not so much. They'll probably be just fine. Um, so I would, I would perhaps take some of that, that seaweed extract, pour it in a little bit of water and let it sit in the sun and see if it starts to foam up. That foam would be an indicator that, that there's something uh, biological happening. So I hope that answered your question. That's brilliant. Thanks to both of you. I'm going to try that when I, <laughs> I'm going to try that one next time in the garden. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Nuan. Glad to have your questions and help drive and definitely want to create some perspectives. I'm going to refresh the room real quick for anyone who may be just joining us. Uh, 
this is microbial ecology's inaugural uh session uh definitely we're going to be focusing on living soil but in the hope we hope in the future we can focus on other ecosystems and other cultivation practices so the purpose is to connect people that have great anecdotal experience with working with biology whether they're cultivating plants their gardening forestry any kind of interaction with the living world on either scale whether it's conventional organic regenerative uh, biodynamic, natural, um, and even bringing in people that have a lot more kind of formal academic experience. Because right now we're kind of we're entering the age of biology as we can fully understand these systems through a number of advanced biotechnologies. So the idea is we have to understand that the or we're just working with these organisms. We tend to forget that the uh, the the stick, the first plow, you push you push the first furrow, um, or the first uh, pad that was used to winnow was just, just as much a piece of biotechnology as a pipette or a DNA sequencer. It's more about this progression from the first tools we use to the latest tools. So definitely want to keep that going. Feel free to hop up, add conversation, comment, and definitely follow the room. Uh, hopefully have lots of conversations to people, whether you're a beginner, you're advanced, no matter where you are in your journey of interacting with the natural world and understanding the consortiums of microorganisms that bind it all together. All right, her, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Feel free to um, introduce yourself, a little bit about you and questions or comments to kind of drive the next round of a conversation. Awesome. Hi, my name is Jenna. I made the mistake by putting my name as Her Buds as my brand, so I can't change it back. But um, I'm a cannabis cultivation educator, and I teach new growers one-on-one, uh, -on -one, whether they be like experienced, um, inexperienced. I have a platform on Instagram where I do a show. We go live, we go into their gardens, and it's basically for the at-home growers. Now, uh, I used synthetic nutrients for about eight years. And in the past year, I switched over to living soils. I, I use a soil called kryptonite in Canada and in the US, it's called castings complete. And it's a just add water super soil. So from veg to harvest, I don't have to feed my plants, period. I am so in love with this and I'm learning more about living soil. Now, I did my outdoor grow last year and with all of the leftover soil that I had, I put it in a pile. I sprayed it with microbes. I think I made the mistake by uh, tilling it and pulling out all of the roots. I put um, a layer of cardboard on the top of it because I know that worms like to eat cardboard. And I'm just hoping that by the time I come back around to it and open everything up, that it's going to be... Um, really fresh soil. Is there any suggestions that you guys can give me on that soil pile in my backyard and what I should do when I reopen it or what I should have done when I was piling it together? Sorry, I couldn't get the mute button. Um, so yeah, you definitely want to avoid tilling it. Um, that's for sure. And, you know, just a little heads up on any type of super soil. Um, they're very easily to get out of balance. So if they get out of balance, they can cause all kinds of issues with um, relationships uh, within plant processes. So I highly recommend you test at the beginning of each run, at the end of each run, and see what that cultivar pulled for uh, nutrients. And then amend only that. Um, people tend to just you know, go, oh, well, I got to up the cycle, so I'm going to throw more nitrogen, more phosphorus, more potassium, more calcium. And that, man, that over a short period of time will get you into a newt lock system, that, a situation that's really going to create havoc for you. Um, I'm personally not a big fan of super soils. I, I would prefer to modify them myself. Um, and so that way I know everything that went in there and what the actual inputs are. Um, there's a lot of uh, unfortunate cheating that goes on within the industry as far as perhaps saying that they're using all organic nutrients because they use something that was OMRI listed that had synthetics in it. Um, but, oh, no, I used OMRI listed, you know. So, you know, again, I, I am a big proponent about know your source inside and out. And if at all possible, do it yourself. Because if you do it yourself, you're never going to get into a problem. Um, so that being said, what I would do with spent soils is I generally take them and I'll add some raw nutrients uh, like, like hay, alfalfa, um, some chips, um, and then ideally inoculate it with a really good compost tea or compost extract so that I know that I'm putting those organisms back into play. 
Um, and generally speaking, then what I'll do is um, I'll water it. I'll put a compost thermometer in there to make sure that it doesn't start to heat up too high. Uh, anything over 120 degrees, you're going to start losing organisms rapidly. At 130, you're going to be pretty much taken over by uh, thermophytic bacteria. Uh, and that's going to, you know, basically kill off everything else that was present that you're trying to keep. Um, and as soon as I realize that that's not going to heat up or if it heats up to 110 and then slowly cools back down, as soon as it gets to 100, I will cover crop it. Now, this, this is the key to the whole thing in rebuilding soils. If you cover crop them, those crops are now going to start building miles of rhizosphere. Now, I often go, oh, no, no, you can't do that. They're going to steal the nutrients. They're not going to steal the nutrients. They're going to uptake the nutrients, and then they're going to use them, the, the nutrients in the plant form. I'm a big proponent of feeding plants plants. Like if I had it my way, uh, I would grow cannabis and I would juice some of that cannabis and spray that cannabis on the other plants that I wanted. Um, because it's free, it's easy to digest, it's, you're not using a lot of energy currency um, in the exchange of collecting sun, pushing down exudates, pulling exudates back up to get the nutrients, you're, you're putting it right on the plant in its plant available form. So cover crop the, the spent soil, let it sit for six months if at all possible, so it builds miles and miles of the rhizosphere that you're looking for because that's where all the magic is happening. That's where all those good organisms are. And if you can cover crop it with, with a hemp plant or hemp seeds, even better because now you're going to be growing the organisms that are ideal for, for that cannabis plant. Um, so that's a great way to deal with, with your spent soils um, so that you're not throwing them away and you are repurposing them. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm from Canada. So um, <clears throat> what I had to do was put the cardboard, cover it with a tarp, and all I did was add the microbes. Now when I come back to it in a few months, uh, is there any other amendments that you think that I should add to the soil? I'll test it, but yeah. Uh, you can always add more microbials. Um, but I wouldn't amend it with anything unless I knew exactly what I was deficient in. Um, and, and this is a quick lesson on soil testing. So what I always do is I, I ask people to do um, three types of tests. One would be a textural. Now in a super soil, the textural test is less important, although it does give you some indication as to how much fines are moving around in your system. So that would be when, those, when that, that substrate breaks down into its finest organic form, um, it's going to be silt. And that silt can build up at the bottom of the pot and create an anaerobic zone. So it can be helpful if it's, if it's multiple runs in that soil to do a textural test just to see how much that silt is building up. Um, and then second would be what's called a basic chemistry test. Um, so that's going to give me all my macronutrients. Um, and I also like uh, trace minerals. That's really important because uh, the the effect of those trace minerals on the pl plant processes are huge. I mean, you can have all the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium in the soil you possibly can imagine, and the plant cake can't take it up because it's missing a couple trace uh, minerals that provide that plant's ability to function certain processes. Um, and the last is a saturated paste test. So a saturated paste test is um, basically identifying your cation exchange capacities holding uh, system. So basically a high CEC is a really good thing. It means that you've got a lot of uh, holding sites um, and the saturated paste tells you what's being held on each one of those sites. So in an ideal range, I wanna see 75% calcium, 17% magnesium, 8% 8% potassium. If that's the range you're in, your gold. Then the second thing I look at right away would be my trace. All my traces are in line. Then I look at my macronutrients and then I amend it accordingly. So hopefully that'll help you with, with the testing part of it. Um, and I'm sorry you can't cover crop up there. Uh, is there any way you could put some, uh, you know, some stilts underneath there and just grow like mushrooms? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great idea. I uh, haven't tried it, but I know that for next year I'll try something different. Uh, sorry, one last thing I just want to note. I know you're not the biggest fan of the super soils, but I enjoy them. 
one thing that I like to do is at the bottom of the pot, I like to add either a layer of perlite or hydrogen. And then I actually water from the bottom because I kind of like the idea of the plant dictating when it wants something. And that's why I like the living soils. You know, the plant wants nitrogen, then the, those bacteria are going to send the nitrogen to the plant. When the plant wants to drink, it wants to drink and it creates more of an aerobic environment with that little um, one or two inch layer at the bottom. You know, I did a whole series on, on this exact thing. Now, in that system, you may get perched water table, which is an issue. Um, but with the system that I came up with because of my past engineering, uh, um, plant engineering or soil engineering work, um, was a what I call a horizontal. So a soil horizon, but this is the horizontal soil system. There's a, a video up on future cannabis project. Um, there's also a podcast that I did on shaping fire, uh, episode 54 on the horizontal soil system, how it functions and how it makes watering an absolute pleasure. And the beauty of this is that now I have sand, silt and clay along with my organic matter. There's a whole consortium of organisms that will only eat clay or only live on sand or only live on silt. And so by not having sand, silt and clay present in your soil system, you're limiting your microbial communities and therefore you're limiting that plant potential. I mean, the goal at the end of the day is to get that cultivar to express every single minor detail it can possibly have stored in its genetics. And the only way you're ever gonna do that is to grow it with, with as many diverse organisms as possible in your soil system. So please check that out because this, that, that one is gonna be really beneficial to you and to all your clients because number one, it takes the watering issues out just like you've already figured out by bottom watering. But this one allows you to top water and it all just stores down in the aquifer or the E horizon or alluvial layer. Um, and then the A horizon helps to um, wick the moisture out of the E and all the way up through the entire O profile. So you never have a situation where you have an anaerobic pocket or a hydrophobic pocket. So definitely check that out. I think you're going to find that really, really uh, helpful. And Leif, did you want to add anything um, definitely on yeah. the notion of uh, amending with how we can get the fungal component up pretty easily if you can't recover uh, crops? No, I, I just had a quick comment on the cardboard note, which is if, if you're, um, you know, layering cardboard on top of your soil, something you'll notice a lot is you know, it's a good test to see how maybe how much fungi is active in your soil is if you have cardboard layered on top of it, whether it's in a pile or on a bed or anywhere, if you pull that cardboard up a few months later, like look and see if there's white strands growing across it. Because if there is, that means there's a good amount of, uh, you know, strong decomposer fungi in there. If you pull up that cardboard and you don't happen to see any white strands growing on it, if, especially if it's been a few months, that's probably a good indication you don't have a lot of fungi in your soil. So that's, just, you know, an indicator or kind of like gross uh, visual observation you can make to assess what's going on microbiologically. And then ultimately like cardboard on top of something on its own isn't really the best way to, I um, mean, you know, hold in the moisture in the ideal microbial conditions. Cause when cardboard gets, I don't know, it's, if this is indoors, you know, it's a different thing, but when, you know, when water lands on it, it's going to wick off more so. So either if there's holes I put in it or, I put tarp uh, over the cardboard as well. Uh, nice. Yeah, like if you can actually like in, like put something like wood chips on top of the cardboard, that may makes it so like water can the moisture can still get in the pile and get out, but it's not going to get you know if, if you know if it's a bare pile and then it's getting water on it, then it's going to be you know get soaked, it's going to get compacted, then you get anaerobic. The cardboard will kind of make it wick off. I mean, the, the tarp will make it wick off, which will make it kind of maintain the moisture content that's already there. But if you know adding cardboard or other carbon rich materials on top of it. Because just in terms of the way that moisture evaporates off of a pile, if there's wood chips or, you know, straw, I mean, straw can have seeds in it. So maybe not, that's not as ideal, but it's, you know, just a material that just physically can soak up and absorb and evaporate water off of it more effectively will help kind of create almost like a moisture buffer where what's in the middle is going to more likely maintain an ideal moisture content for microbial growth. And so it's almost like, you know, creating like a, an incubation layer, a blanket that can soak up and absorb and release moisture. So those are just a few thoughts in terms of um, you know, soil pile storage and 
potentially trying to assess like, uh, you know, on a more gross intuitive level, like what the microbial action might be like. Awesome. All right. Well, um, any last comments here? Um, we want to move on, but I'd love to hear some other feedback, some insights you gained from the little conversation we had. Um, thank you. I'm following this group now and I'm really looking forward to learning more about living soils. I appreciate you sharing the space with me. Thank you so much. I'm going to move you back to the audience. I'm going to queue up Johnny. Hey, can you guys hear me? Okay. Sorry. I'm out kind of outside. We can hear you. All right, Johnny. Go right ahead. All right, cool. So, uh, yeah, so, 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 so Johnny, share us a little bit about of your background and uh, some context and then we'll go ahead and share your comment or question and we'll keep the conversation moving. Definitely. So my name is Johnny. Uh, my Instagram handle is mindfully rooted. I know I've spoken with some of you guys. I've been checking out like your guys is uh, um, the webinars and things that you guys have been putting together with uh, the learning living soil stuff and the stuff's been awesome. But I had one follow up question from like the last um, individual that was speaking about like the kelp stuff that Layton, you'd made a comment about um, like the harvesting fresh kelp, putting it in water and then using that as an inoculum. I was wondering if like, if that would be like the same thing as if you made like a kelp uh, JLF, for instance, like if that sat there for a long time, would you use that at like that same type of application or are you using that like a little bit differently? Um, I'm asking because I just started a compost pile recently that's all like leaves, wood chips and uh, uh, grass clippings. And um, I was wondering if that would be something that like you would dilute in or would you just really like just pour that in like I guess like you were saying, like after using that like for four or five days. Um, I can't comment on the on the uh, natural farming um, product that you mentioned, but I'm sure Craig will follow up with it. Um, but as far as 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 an inoculant for your compost pile, oh, it's fire, my friend. Um, and I know I've seen your compost pile because we've been chatting off off this platform. And uh, yeah, you live in San Diego, so why the heck yeah. not take a day trip out there? Yeah. Um, and especially after a big storm, you're going to get a lot of fresh stuff. And again, you want to put it in a bucket. You know, I, I take a five gallon compound bucket or, or you know, regular, you know, Home Depot bucket, fill uh -huh. it three, three quarters of the way full with 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 the um, kelp or the seaweed. And again, diversity, look for multiple colors, different shapes of leaves, get everything you possibly can throw that in a bucket of water, fill, you know, fill the water up till it hits the top of the leaves. Um, you know, try to push everything down a little bit in, into the water if you can, add a little bit more water if necessary, um, and then put it in the sun with nothing, just, just, just the water. And don't wash anything off, leave everything intact, so you're going to end up with sand in the bottom of the bucket, but no big deal. Um, and then, then let it ferment till it starts to foam. When you start seeing that white foam, and it usually, it took me five days up here in the sun. Um, as the sun gets a little bit hotter, uh, it might be less. So if you're doing this in the summer, it might only take four days. Um, right now, I think it's probably a little lower than when I did it. So it might take six days or seven days. But you'll know what, what I'm talking about because it's going to foam up and it's going to get this funky smell to it. Um, it's like a musk. It's not, it doesn't smell horrible, but it's definitely something you'd go, I don't think I should drink this, right? And so that's going to be a really good indicator that you are where the sweet spot is. And then I would water it in and I would just bury that, bury that kelp that was in there, you know, right in, right in with it, kind of mix it in a little bit. Um, the kelp is definitely going to get funky. You're going to definitely get some anaerobic pockets around it, but that's okay. By the time you come back and use it, they'll be gone. And, and you'll now have all of that amazing trace elements um, built into your pile uh, as a, as a, you know, as a freebie. Got it. Do you, would that be any different than like, I mean, I, I did what you said, but my bucket's been sitting here probably for about a month now. Um, Cause I use it as a liquid fertilizer for my garden, but I was just wondering like, would I be able just to take that basically same thing? And would that kind of have the same implication on my compost pile? Uh, so it's been there a month in the sun. Um, I have it. I mean, well, I guess like traditional, like Jadon practices, like the it's, it's a closed lid. So I have it, um, Basically, I put the kelp in, I filled it with fresh water, I added some leaf mold to it, and then I shut the lid or put a plastic bag over the top so that way no air is getting into it. Well, why don't you open it up, my friend? Give it, give it some fresh air and uh, give it some sunlight. Because again, you know, the, the algae spores that are going to come off of that kelp and are attached to it and living around it in, in it, 
um, will love the sunlight to, to really grow out. And again, you're, you're using successionary systems um, to get the other predators that you're really looking for to come out. Now, I love terrestrial algae. I think they're another one of those organisms that we don't talk about, even in these living soil circles, as much as we should, um, because there are terrestrial algae, contrary to people's belief that, that an aquatic plant can live in a terrestri terrestrial environment. But um, IMO collections, you'll see them. Um, I call the time cross across them in, in soil systems, really healthy soil systems, um, because again, they can grow in the water. And we know in the water pockets in the, in the healthy soil system. And we know that uh, red, far red, uh, penetrates down as far as five meters into the soil system. So they have a light source. Um, so I would pull the lid off that thing, open it up to the sun, and see if it starts to foam on it. And then just hit me up on, D DM me on IG, and we'll, we'll stay in touch about that. Um, Craig, you wanna, good, yeah. Craig, you want to talk about the Jadam side of that at all? Are you familiar Ooh, with it? Yeah. I just opened up the bucket right now and there's like this huge like layer of like white grayish shit on the top of it. It looks great for Jandam, I mean, guest style, but yeah, it's bubbling and everything on me. Getting lots of proteins moving around and decomposing oh, yeah. and recomposing. Yeah, well, so- um something on that algae for, for mm -hmm. a second here though. Is it like you're saying, Layden, like algae grows in soil, grows in terrestrial soil, grows on the surface of soil, grows deep in soil. Anywhere there can be enough moisture to be maintained, it's there. It grows on the surface of plants. And there's actually complete tangent here, but I recently learned about there's this type of lichen, which, you know, lichens are all symbioses between fungi and algae, where the, the fungus of the lichen doesn't actually even form like a body structure. It just grows around algae that grows on the surface of mosses and creates a symbiotic structure like above surface where it's the, you know, the algae and the fungus feeding into each other. So yeah, when we think about like, where can algae be, where can these organisms be, we should be pretty creative in what we can expect they're capable of. Nice rant, Craig, love it. Uh, Craig, I mean, Leaf, nice rant. Um, Craig, do you want to pop in on Jadam? Do you know that? that? Yeah, so Jadam so is something I'm really interesting and I can kind of provide a bit of background. Um, so, so uh, the, one of the people that more so kind of formalized a lot of practices that become natural farming, who's from Korea, hence the, the notion that nat natural farming is often sometimes called Korean natural farming, is uh, Master Cho, uh, I think, I believe is uh, his, is, so his given name is, uh, his, his surname is Cho, uh, and his given name, I think it's uh, Han Yu. Uh, but his son um, was really interested in making it even more accessible, because one of the things with natural farming is that you depend uh, a fair amount on inputs such as sugar, to allow this fermentation process, usually when preserving microbes to uh, create this osmotic pressure where you're pretty much stabilizing them, pulling most of the water uh, out of the microbes you've cultured um, and for forcing, the, forcing the, the, the fungi to sporulate and um, the other, other uh, bact bacteria, uh, nematodes and protozoa to insist. Um, so he was looking at taking it to the next level by taking the natural materials that are utilizing, leveraging the natural yeasts and algae and fungi that are present on the matter, and then using a passive fermentation process, letting it sit on water uh, and emulate this natural fermentation process um, to a point where most people, as long as they had, a, uh, where they maybe even a sugary, sh where maybe even sugar or some of the rice or some of the grains that are used in natural farming, to uh, culture your microbes and to stabilize your microbes might be a luxury for some people, whereas in our culture, we kind of take them for granted uh, given the fact we're able to afford them in general. So the notion of taking your uh, natural plant material, letting it sit and ferment for a set amount of time, and then um, changing the ecology from an anaerobic uh, static ecology inside the bucket or the vessel where it's fermenting, and then introducing it, um, uh, introducing uh, aerobic um and, and inter arabic ecology into that and kind of changing over the nutrients i something i'm really interested in looking into i think there's a lot of uh interesting science to be investigated from a microbial standpoint under microscopy and even using molecular techniques to understand what's going on but i think it's a notion that the more people can utilize the benefits that that microorganisms provide just no matter what they have available to them even using the naturally occurring microbes on the plant matter and crop matter that are able to produce no matter what scale or price point i think it's a fascinating concept well said my friend well said 
Um, do we have any uh, other questions from you, Johnny? No, nah, man, I think that does great. I got to get back to my, I'm, I'm emptying some fish amino acid buckets right now. So I'm going to get back to doing that. But I really appreciate uh, you answering those questions for me. Absolutely. Johnny, Johnny you're a brave man uh, getting, working on the FAA bucket with a hand on the phone as well. I, oh, I yeah. I'm, that, <laughs> there I'm, needs to I'm be trying. Uh, there needs to be a, a hands-free mute on mute function on this application. I yeah, I know. If I wish I could like tap it somehow, but yeah, I'm I'm <laughs> carrying my buckets in my garden right now while I'm trying to do this. So I'm gonna awesome. get back to that. But I really appreciate you guys taking the time to answer those questions. And uh, and, and Johnny, uh, maybe real quick, um, and Stop. kind of to get people up on the stage that are curious, maybe talk more about what FAA is, how you prep it, a quick little summary, and maybe we can get someone up here for another question for the last yeah. uh, twenty or thirty or so minutes of the room. Yeah, definitely. So um, it's actually something that I recently started carrying on my website, uh, mindfullyrooted.org. I've been uh, collecting fish. I, I'm a big proponent of like um, collecting fish waste or just collecting trash from whatever people might think is trash because I live in a city um, and trying to find a way to make it very resourceful for people to um, basically like find easy ways, like I guess an urban way of becoming a natural farmer in a sense. So I go to like fish markets and stuff and I get them to give me their fish waste um, where they would normally just dump in the trash. So instead of it going to the landfill, um, I basically collect their fish guts, their fish heads, the tails, the spleens, whatever the case is. Um, and then basically I take that and I mix it with equal weight of brown sugar to slow down the fermentation process. Cause if you just put fish in a bucket, it'll putrefy. Um, so the sugar basically helps slow down the fermentation process of the fish so that way you can kind of keep it in whole. Um, and then at that point, um, basically it's like a nitrogen and amino acid um, supplement for your soil. Um, it takes about six months to break down. Um, I mean, I wouldn't pull anything earlier than six months, but uh, about a year typically, um, after about a year, you can basically, you have this like thick oil layer that sits on the top that a lot of industries will skimp off. I know late, and I think you've talked about that where even with like fish hydrolysis products and stuff, they like take the, they strip the oil from it and sell it off to other industries. Or fish amino acids, basically, you'll have it's a full spectrum product having everything in it, um, the oil and everything, um, to where you can use that. It's just a highly available uh, nitrogen supplement, amino acid supplement for your for your plants. Um, and if you live somewhere where they have they sell fish, go to restaurants, go to markets, talk to them, see what they'll give you. I mean, this stuff's gonna go in the trash. And if you can put it into a little jar, I mean, ferment it for six months or a year, you're gonna have some some prized stuff. And if you get hot, like high quality fish, where if you go fishing and you catch it yourself, I mean, man, you can make some killer fish sauce to cook with and make some stir fries with it as well. Awesome, thanks, well Johnny. Said. Well said, Johnny. And I think definitely that's a great transition. Of Johnny, I'm gonna move you back to the audience and good luck with the FAA. Uh, definitely, thank you, looking, man. Ho hope to have you back on here and definitely check out. Uh, Johnny's website, mindfullyrooted.org. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Cheers. Yeah, and definitely, I think it's a great note. We can talk about how, you know, waste is an interesting notion, right? We're, you know, human beings are the only animals that waste anything. And it's the notion, kind of this obsolescence and consumption when in the natural world, um, one organism's waste product or, you know, let's say, um, you know, exudate or metabolite is another organism's food. So it's pretty interesting because we have the capability of having somewhat large brains. We're able to coordinate and cooperate and we're able to manipulate our environment. So I think it's an excellent opportunity how we can look at a lot of these systems in place where people are often just discarding them or not utilizing them. We can truly embody closed loop principles. We can emulate the notion that, you know, the biology, the ecology is one dynamic system. And with a little bit of intuition, some planning, we can take things that people would just willingly throw out, um, you know, at, you know, at, at, at you know, at, at the minimum, turn into a great input. And even at the maximum, turn into something that's actually profitable, that actually builds that cycle and system back and forth. Uh, and that's something that's actually pretty incredible to work with and utilize, given the fact that we have a whole number of processes in place as well. Hey, Leaf, so I want to pass it over to you on that notion with uh, kind of closing loops and kind of leveraging. I think we mentioned cardboard earlier. Um, I'm definitely kind of setting up the question here, but what's a great way how we can kind of maybe uh, end the cardboard apocalypse uh, with using some uh, leftover materials from uh, mushroom cultivation? Yeah, it depends on how much room you got in your backyard. Uh. <laughs> 
Pit uh, Moss, Pit Moss, Pit Moss. <laughs> Right. Yes. I mean, we we got to look at it on, uh, I guess, multiple scales. One is the more industrial scale. And I guess that's the, you know, the pit moss idea, send it to someone who can shred it up and convert it into something for you. But if you're just a, you know, a lowly person that doesn't know how to get your paper waste products to, you know, high level industrial manufacturer who can turn it into a soil amendment, we can all kind of just begin the process of turning paper into soil by feeding it to <laughs> various organisms. But a lot of, like white rot fungi will be very good at this. And when I say white rot fungi, I'm talking about the type of fungus that can break down wood in trees. And this includes things like oyster <laughs> mushrooms, King Strafaria, stuff like that. So these are common edible mushroom cultivars that if you know of a mushroom farm, a spawn supplier, like you'll be able to order these. And then you can take pretty much all the paper products you get and soak them and these things will break them down. Now, if, if your ultimate end goal is to use this paper in some way and you're growing a practice or as a soil amendment, then maybe you want to leave out the things like the glossy magazines with all the ink and the staples and stuff in them. If, if you know, if you're mo- more just trying to digest it, you can leave those in. The general idea is that any of your cardboard, you know, non-dyed bleached paper material is made out of plant substance. And if you soak it in water and then add mo- mushroom spawn of the right species, like oysters or strafaria, they will grow in it. And so like I have, I have bins, you know, inside of my house where I've got like a tote bin, drill some holes in it. All the paper waste I get, I leave, I put it in a paper bag and then once every month or so, I mean, I don't, I don't buy a lot of stuff, so I don't have a whole lot, but I soak it. And then let it soak overnight and then layer it in a tote bin with holes drilled in it. Add in some oyster mycelium, which I personally get because I, got, I know someone who has a mushroom farm about an hour away. So I'll, I'll actually get spent mushroom substrate from him. So this is the stuff that he's just going to like turn into his own compost pile. But I'll grab the bag of old mycelium and instead break it up and throw it in this bin. And, and at first it seems slow and you're like, why do I have a bin full of wet paper? Like, what, what am I doing? Like, have I gone, have I gone mad? Have I gone crazy? But then like you come check back on it like four months later and it's actually just like the paper is a substrate of mycelium and it's a big white block that you have to like rip the stuff off of. It's not going to turn it into soil on its own. But what's interesting about this is you all have probably, you know, experimented with throwing paper and cardboard into your compost pile as a brown or a carbon material in it and often that will cause kind of you know wet sopping cardboard anaerobia things don't really break down but if before you put the cardboard in you soak it let mycelium grow out on it like that and then put it into the compost pile it's first of all it's been pre-digested that fungal mycelium has broken down the complex like lignin cellulose plant bonds in it secondly it's also covered in a bunch of active living mycelium that's going to kickstart your compost pile either either by decomposing things or by being eaten itself by another uh, microbe so that's yeah it's like one technique you know and and it's funny because sometimes you hear like fancy words like biodigestion like oh we're going to set up a biodigester and all that means is like you're adding some living thing to a material to break it down faster so we could call this a, you know, mycelium fungal paper biodigester, but it's really just like a pile of, of cardboard with some fungus on it. But the point is that if you use this, first of all, you can make your composting kind of kickstarted more with this type of material. But also you could even take that if it's clean, if it's not covered in green and blue molds and things like that, you could take that material, actually use it to inoculate, say, wood chips or straw or sawdust and you know grow edible mushrooms with it so it's kind of like if it's a plant-based material there's probably a way we can utilize a fungus to work with it and turn it into something you know greater and more useful than it is already awesome yeah i think definitely there's a lot of potential in utilizing these waste streams which are abundant i think definitely even before the before this time last year with COVID, we were kind of living in a cardboard apocalypse with everyone kind of ordering everything to go next day shipping. So the idea is how can we catch these sources? And it seems a little absurd, right? You know, the notion is that, you know, trees have evolved to have this complex uh, matrix of lignin cellulose and hemicellulose, the structural polymers that make wood wood. 
but we've kind of chopped them down, macerated them, turned them into a mold, and really done all the heavy lifting for a lot of these organisms to kind of turn that carbon back into uh, humic matter to build soils, but it just kind of ends up in the dump, unfortunately. So hopefully we can work on that aspect. Mario, how's it going? Glad to have you on. Um, definitely, we'd love to hear from you. Definitely introduce yourself uh, and yeah, shoot us a question or a comment that we can kind of close out the room with. Oh, thank you so much. I'm from Costa Rica. I, I'm following all the things that you do, like KNF. Uh, well, I'm practicing JADAM too. And uh, well, the biodigestion thing, I think that uh, you can add uh, labs in there too. Like not only all that microbes working, well, they were, they will work together, but uh, I mean, with labs, I. I think that it will be better because you can reduce a lot that smell of all that thing. Um, the other thing I use that I can uh, go in, in here, like a few moments ago, and you was talking about IMO, a, a aquatic indigenous microorganisms. And I want to collect that in here. So, I hear it from, and I read, write him, uh, Steve Dritz, he uh, are planning to do videos in YouTube about that. And we here in Costa Rica have a lot of things like rivers with a lot of minerals with like, like blue rivers, or we have a lot of volcanoes too. So I want to collect that, uh, but I don't know how for, for sure, because it's very new. Um, if you can help me a little, I will be, I will appreciate it too much. Sorry about my English, because um, it's not my first language. No worries, but... Mario. Thank you for asking the question. Leighton, do you want to take it away about maybe giving Mario some advice about how to culture or good spots to prospect uh, aquatic microorganisms? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, the Steve Dredd came up with a technique, which I, I applaud him for. Um, it's it, He calls it sponge tech. Basically... Go buy a raw sponge, so a natural sea sponge, um, tie a string around it, and then throw it in the, in the river or the stream. Try to find some place where um, there's not a lot of current, like you want an eddy where you see the backflow of the water um, so that you're getting uh, somewhat of a still place for that sponge to just hang out on the bottom, um, and the organisms will come to it. So that's, that's a great trick. The other trick is to again in that eddy collect some of the silt um, so you want it to be very very dark in color uh, almost black <clears throat> and that's going to house another uh, tremendous amount of of, of micro or aquatic microorganisms and then of course it's just the water itself so it's a combination of you know maybe perhaps these three techniques would give you the most diverse uh, collection of those organisms and then ideally if you can go home and put it in like a cone bottom tank with some oxygen or not oxygen, some air pump or air, air supply, like an aquarium and bubble it for a few days to really start to grow those organisms out um, and then apply it to your, uh, apply it to your soil. Now you could take it another step, uh, but I, I recommend that you do this very, very carefully. And depending on the size of the tank that you're brewing in, and again, I like cone bottoms with the air coming up the center of the cone, not, not the square totes. Uh, the square totes, everything tends to collect in the corners um, and it has the potential to go anaerobic. So I'm not a big fan of, of those types of brewing tanks, uh, but you can add a little bit of molasses. And I mean a very little bit. <clears throat> what that'll do is that'll grow out the aquatic bacteria, which are very valuable. But more importantly, you'll start to grow out the protozoa because again, prey predator. You, the more prey you have, the more predators are going to come out of cyst and they're going to start to multiply um, very quickly. It usually takes 24 to 30 hours to really hit peak um, protozoa um, production. So, and again, if you use too much molasses, it's going to go anaerobic and crash and you're going to have a nasty smelling uh, mess to deal with. So, you know, again, if you're going to use foods, go very, very slow and low, like a little bit at a time. Watch what happens. Um, if everything smells really sweet, you know you got the sweet spot. The nose, the nose is one of our most amazing senses as far as 
knowing if something's good for us or bad for us. Um, it, it's, it's critical in aromatherapy, um, which is a real thing. So, you know, again, if you're, if you're smelling an inoculant that smells sweet um, or, or a little musky, that's okay. If it smells really horrible, don't use it. You know, uh, I highly recommend you put it in a compost pile that you're not going to be using for a long time to come. So I hope that helped you, Mario. Leighton, thank you so much. Uh, uh, the other thing is, uh, if I don't use like only melassa a little bit, and I add uh, FBJ or uh, something like fuel, like another kind of sugar, it, it can reproduce uh, microorganisms in as the same way, I think. And the other is that if I can mix all the microorganisms, like from lake, from, I don't know how to say naciente, where the water come from the earth. Uh, there's two spots in Costa Rica that I know, and is like volcanoes and rivers. And I don't know if in the bucket to water pump it, I can collect different microorganisms in the same place. Thank you. Um, I think what you're talking about is a groundwater seep or, a, or we call it an artesian well, where the water just bubbles up out of the ground. Um, that would be an interesting place to collect because now you're, now you're dealing with subterranean organisms. So not, not surface grown. So you're not gonna get any algaes. Um, I, don't, I don't know what you'd be actually collecting. And to be honest with you, anytime I've ever microscoped um, really good looking groundwater or, or, or artesian well water, I haven't seen a lot of life coming out of the water, but I've seen a lot of aquatic organisms in the pool that, that where that water is bubbling into. So as it comes out of the rock or the hole, it bubbles in and it creates a little pool. In that pool, there's incredible biodiversity. And I attribute that to all of the minerals that are in that water. You know, that highly mineral water feeds the organisms. I mean, the, the, if you want to see something really cool is, is if you um, go to NASA's website, they have a, a satellite photography of a diatom plume where the glaciers are melting and all this super rich mineral water is coming down and hitting the ocean. And then you can just see these clouds of diatoms because they need the nutrients. So and they're just another aquatic organism um, that I have also seen terrestrial. So um, yeah, it's all about the nutrient water. It's, it's kind of like primordial soup. You, if you provide all the food, something's going to grow there and often a very diverse population of different organisms. So yeah, I, I'm interested in uh, you know, t encouraging you to continue on. Uh, just to back up one second real quick, for whatever reason, what's in molasses has a very unique property. Um, I remember having this conversation with someone a while back and I don't remember what it is that is just so microbi microbially available, uh, unlike a lot of other sugars. And I have done experiments with um, stevia, table sugar, powdered sugar, uh, brown sugar, and I've never had a better result than with molasses. But again, you have to just use just a little bit or you're going to cause problems. Thank you, Leighton. The last thing is, uh, what? well, I look at an image of National Geographic uh, about a microscope looking uh, microbes on an asteroid. So in the sea, the, all, there's a lot of microorganisms and in other aquatic places, but uh, I think the life come from the sites and we are, we are from there. So there's a lot of microorganisms to play with in plants. Yes, that's called panspermia for the audience out there. It's a, it's a unique concept. Um, Dr. Elaine and I, we were trapped in Rodale during Superstorm Sandy and uh, but there was only like three of us left there. Everyone had vacated because of the, you know, the impending storm. And I basically got trapped. She was trapped. Um, and so we st stayed up one night playing Uno and drinking beer. And I asked her, I said, Elaine, you know, what do you believe? You think that, you know, creation was like the God particle or, or the hand of God? Or do you think an alien came by and, and, and defecated on the, on the surface of the planet? Or do you think it, you know, that came in on a comet? And her answer was the comet, because uh, in past history, every time there's been a great plague, um, if you look back, 
there was a comet that came by shortly there before. And it only makes sense that we as a biological system, if we get exposed to a virus that is unlike something that we've come across, then it will do, uh, you know, cause great pains in, in our uh, immune system. Whether it kills us or not, it, it's, it's, you know, irrelevant, but it does, it does shake up our immune system, something serious. So, you know, I, 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 I hear you, Mario, and I love talking about that. So thanks for bringing that up. Well, let me, let me throw on something there. So, like, if, uh, you know, where'd life come from? It was probably some sort of RNA, DNA-based thing. And then, like, what made that appear out of what was there before? Then maybe there was some precursory proteins or enzyme-type structures. But, like, what's the main disturbance that's really going to really shake stuff up on the face of this planet is probably when a meteor or a comet hits the surface. And then that's, like, that's a, that's a big explosion. That's a lot of stuff changing. So just from, a, like, a practical, like, how do, you know, physical impacts in the cosmos play out thing, you know, it's hard to think that, yeah, you know something like that didn't influence the evolution of life on earth well remember that article we were reading about the space station uh they had uh five different types of bacteria or protozoa that they found living inside uh, they had uh bacteria that they actually planted on the outside of the space station and when they scraped up the biofilm and brought it back in it was still alive we know tardigras can, can live in space for long periods of time. So we'd be pretty foolish to think that the potential for a comet or a meteorite to not be carrying some kind of biological uh, passengers is, is kind of silly, at least in my mind. I look at, uh, sorry. Is that yeah, now go ahead. We're saying from from the soil to the cosmos, we really really got got out there here. And I thought we were talking about living soil, but uh, <laughs> good work, everybody. Yeah, definitely, and um, that's something I maybe wanted to bring up, uh, but it was something pretty interesting. I think even this week, some proceedings were published uh, in Frontiers in Microbiology, the International Space Station. They discovered a. Uh, for novel strains of bacteria living in different places. Um, now, in the International Space Station, they're attempting to perform a number of controlled environment agriculture. So it's really interesting because, one, you're dealing with a microgravity environment, and then this is a whole new field of how biology interacts. Like, you have a, even a dedicated branch of medicine related to space because the way the body reacts, um, everything from uh, immune functioning to injury to <clears throat> healing is entirely different given the fact there's a lot less... Uh, impact upon the of uh, the environment and the body without such a gravity force. If we, uh, a force of gravity, or impact of gravity is if you were on the Earth as well. So it's interesting, kind of look at the observations dynamics. So what's amazing is they found a number of species of actually nitrogen fixing bacteria, and this is something that you know in a lot of conventional ag people are looking to because in conventional ag we're applying a fair amount of nitrogen amendments to the soil when in reality there are free living nitrogen fixers there are root associated nitrogen fixers as well and then one perfect example where you have a contained environment with human beings working these controlled environment agricultural systems it's funny i think they they cultured one of the uh the nitrogen fixers on the actual uh, dining room table so it's interesting yeah i think it's going to be an interesting topic we can talk more about um, so unfortunately, Tom, Tom Lai was, was not able to hear today. He be in today. He was actually sent me a, pi a picture of a Petri dish, him culturing a soil microbe. He is working also in his grant cycle coming up as well, but we definitely want to integrate people that have lots of amazing anecdotes, um, uh, but also new developments kind of going the whole cycle of, uh, of aquatic systems to land to interactions. And even, um, the fact that we are covered in these microbes and that we're going to be inoculating the environments we interact with. Uh, as sterile as we attempt to make them any kind of given way. Anyway, uh, but yeah, so any last thoughts from anyone? Mario, I'm going to, I wanted to just, uh, wanted to thank you for your awesome questions and wish you all the best luck in, uh, in, uh, in down in Costa Rica. Definitely feel free to follow us and stay in contact. Amazing, some bio prospects there. Mario, was there any last comments you wanted to add before we wrap up the room? I, I like too much these. I will follow you because I learned too much from you guys. Uh, the last thing to say is that, uh, yeah, in NASA and uh, different space companies is sending microbes to space to look 
if they uh, be alive and and when they come back they still alive so i'm thinking that we come from start but yeah it's not a topic for for ecology and microbial living soil so let's back to living soil sorry about my question no thank you mario we love the stimulation i'm going to move you back to the audience love to see you more in the room in the future but uh i think we can close at the room and uh, i'm going to pass it over to you leighton yeah i just wanted to touch base on one other new uh, completely new study of biology, and that is uh, the biology related to forest fires. Uh, there was a woman out here in Southern California that has done some really breakthrough work on capturing ash and smoke um, that is covered with, with protozoa, bacteria, and fungi. So to think that the world is not pushing or changing or exchanging organisms um, on a global scale, again, is very small-minded, let alone on a galactic scale. So that's that's the way I'd like to end it for, for now. Thanks. Yeah, now I'm glad you brought that up. Actually, me and Craig were scheduled to interview this uh, professor from uh, UC Irvine tomorrow. We had to postpone it, who she does all sorts of environmental microbiology, mycology, fungal stuff. And one of the topics was actually like microbial inoculations of forest fire spaces. And yeah, I mean, it's just I, like Mario's comments and questions were so so profound and important there because it's really tying into like why this is potentially maybe at least one of the most important topics we can even think about as humans like the microbial ecology it's like it's very fundamental gets to the base of who we are and what's happening on the planet so it's an honor to be here in this conversation with all y'all and uh yeah thanks everyone Absolutely. Um, so yeah, we're definitely, it's 9.04. We've gone for about two hours. Uh, I think we can wrap up the room for tonight, but definitely stay tuned. We want to host all a whole range of conversations. We're going to try to organize a couple people, um, provide a whole range of things from beginner to intermediate to advanced. Um, hopefully we're going to be getting more people in formal academia up on here. I think it's a great opportunity to connect people who um, maybe don't interact with too many people outside their lab or outside a conference who are finding people in the everyday um, anecdotal experience that are really interested in kind of this dedicated focused research or folk they're, uh, they're performing on a daily basis. So again, my name is Craig. Uh, this has been uh, Microbial Ecology's inaugural session. I think it was great. We got a number of perspectives from people um, from all over the world, which is phenomenal. And I think we can uh, on, to, on to something really exciting here as we kind of connect people that are working with these tool, these systems and organisms every single day and even with people on the cutting edge of technologies to characterize these relationships and interactions really fascinating exciting stuff all right so if anyone's I, interested definitely oh go ahead Peter. i was gonna say just quickly for like the 100 people or so who have been tuned in on youtube and are chatting away uh we'll try to get some of those questions answered next time i sent you guys an email with a bunch of the questions but uh this is not a one-off opportunity to ask questions. It's a recurring thing. So we'll, uh, we'll get to the questions that haven't been answered uh, at some point. Phenomenal. Apo apologies to the YouTube followers, Peter. Sorry about that. We'll have to figure out a better way to chat while we're doing this. Yeah, they, they, they got to get cool and join the club. They got to get someone to invite them in the club. Like, come on. Like, well, it's, it, well in, 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 the me, in, the, in the meantime, I think we can set up an email address or something where we can have a DM and uh, feed it as well. But right. definitely excited for the direction it's going. I think we have a wide number of people here on Clubhouse and even on YouTube where we're kind of streaming it, really digging the kind of audio interactions and conversations. I think everyone is a little uh, little zoomed out with all the video conferencing. And so hopefully we can kind of uh, kind of have like a little fireside conversations with audio and kind of visualize with our mind's eye what we're talking about these amazing interactions from large focus. All right, everyone, my name is Craig Trester. Feel free to follow me and any of the speakers. Follow the club. Feel free to join the club. I'll go ahead and approve you and um, stay posted. Uh, we'll try to organize more rooms in the future. And I think this is a great way to get people um, in any point of your journey of interacting with the natural world, um, talking together and kind of making these kind of inter sections and these kind of um, X factors and uh, doubling effects of interactions and understanding from any scale and form and function. All right. Thank you all for joining tonight. All right. So I'm going to end the room. We'll do a countdown from five, five, four, three, three two, two one. one. Take care, everyone.
it's time for dinner in LA. Everyone, uh, have a good night. Thanks for tuning in.